Thank you very much. It's great to be here with friends. <laughs> you know, I uh, often said that when I'd go on campaign trips, especially when we went out on these national uh, tours, that we'd get some nice applause. And I said, you know, I've given a lot of speeches on the House floor, and I never got an applause <laughs> from it. But it is great to be among friends. This is just great. You know, Tom is the first one that ever mentioned that I remember listening to, and he brings up the subject of the Whiskey Rebellion, <laughs> because I'm fascinated because we uh, were raised in Green Tree, and there was a place that we got about 100, mile, 100 miles, 100 yards from where I lived, and uh, there was a big ridge and down there, and that was called Whiskey Hollow, <laughs> and, and that, that, that existed. So that, uh, that was interesting, but I, I was sort of, I was thinking about, uh, you know, different things for the local history. And there, was, uh, there was a story, and I'll, I'll ask Tom afterwards if he remembers it, because he was probably around back then. This was during the Civil War. <laughs> so no, during the Civil War, I think there was a special case dealing with the draft. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think the locals were on the right side of that one also. <laughs> you know? So uh, that, that, that was, but other than that, Green Tree doesn't have a whole lot to a whole lot to claim, but you know, I, I think uh, I think we're uh, pretty, pretty fortunate today uh, to have such a great event. And the Mises Institute shared all this, did a lot of this work. But uh, we've talked about Lou, and I've talked about him, and there's a lot of praise. But how about giving Daniel McAdams some applause? <laughs> You don't know, I think he created this title, The, uh, the uh, Truth About uh, the Death of Truth in, uh, in America. And I thought, well, how, how could that be? I, don't, I just don't believe in that. Because we just have to look at, at Daniel. There's always hope. I mean, he's from Berkeley. <laughs> he's from Berkeley. And how many years did he work for the federal government? bunch of years and he he all of a sudden showed up he says I'm I'm a true believer and uh, of course we've worked together for a long time but uh, he has been a great help and I um, I uh, often thought that uh, you, you know do I get any credit for this at all and I thought I'll fib a little bit I started RPI but that would be a lie <laughs> Because it, Daniel had started, you know, the Institute. And uh, I can remember it very clearly. We had probably a month left or a couple weeks left in the uh, congressional office. And uh, he had worked probably 10 years by that time and always, uh, you know, keeping me straight and looking up the things I had to have uh, for, for the speeches. But he, uh, he was... Uh, he was really, you know, very helpful in all that we did. And I think that that has helped. And then when he came, he says, I want to start this institute. And uh, I said, well, you know, what about it? But uh, I knew his position. I didn't have to worry about uh, finding out what his beliefs were. And uh, so I said, yes, go ahead. And, uh, but the thing of it is, I thought he was just going to do it, but he wanted me to be involved. Can you imagine that? But, but anyway, it, it's worked out well. And uh, he worries sometimes because he says, I wonder if anybody will come. Last, last night he was wondering whether we'd have anybody or anybody come to our, our meetings. So uh, he, his worry and concern is a better word for it. His concern is very good, but it helps me. I figure oh, he'll, take, he'll take care of it and uh, let him help, you know, everything. But it is, uh, it is a real delight, uh, you know, uh, to, to be here uh, today. There's been quite a few events like this. We have worked closely with the Mises Institute, and, and it's, a, it's a group that... Uh, uh, Lou Rockwell, you, you, you know, and I worked with, you know, the, uh, uh, the Foundation for Ec Economics and Education. And uh, that, that was instrumental. Leonard Reed was a, re re had a great deal of influence on me. And one thing that he taught, and I was talking to Lou a couple of days ago and was sorry he wasn't going to be able to come. I said the one thing that I liked about the conferences that he's worked on, uh, 
They reminded me of the conferences that Leonard Reed did. Not large groups. That he, the goal wasn't to have uh, real large groups. It was goal was to get people who were interested in understanding uh, the, the, the issues. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have large groups. If there's going to be demonstrations, it's always great if there you get a million people out there and they're saying the things that we like. That's, that's okay. But I think there's a place for each one. But I think the uh, Mises Institute and hopefully the work that we do at RPI and the Free Foundation, that it emphasizes, uh, you, you know, the, the education. But I do worry about the audience all the time because I talk about the long, you know, the young, the young audience. So I am delighted that the whole audience is filled up with young people today. <laughs> but we, we have to have uh, young, young at heart at least. So this is, this is just w wonderful that uh, we're able to get together and enjoy ourselves because uh, if it's a bore and you're thinking of the end of privacy and end of truth, uh, that's a little bit more negative than I want. That is, if we don't do our job, that's it. So if we continue exciting people and people coming and exciting us to get this message on, it, it shouldn't be the end because the more I looked into this issue of uh, tr truth, uh, and <clears throat> the, the more I was convinced, it started a long time ago, the debate on, 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 on truth and uh, right and wrong. And that's, uh, that I think is the big issue that politicians have to, have to deal with. But you know, there was, there was a time, and it happens to have dealt with uh, Berkeley. Uh, I think Daniel was off in Europe someplace. Maybe. No, he was around then, but maybe he was the one that was inspiring him. But I was always amazed, and I took a little personal, uh, you, you know, uh, acceptance of it. I was excited about it because I didn't count. I, I, said, I, I most of the time I'd look out and say, "Where do these people come from?" So I was always personally pleased. But uh, I think it turned out that Berkeley was our largest crowd. So we had, you know, not not quite as big as Trumps. But for us, it was good. <laughs> but, it, but it happened to do bigger than some of those other people that were running, running, uh, you, you know, for the presidency. But I, I, thought, I thought it was great because, uh, you know, during those uh, two campaigns we did, we never got a lot of grief. You know, we didn't have demonstrations. And I think times were different then, not quite as bad as they are today. And I keep wondering, wonder what it would be like now. But I think that, uh, I think that uh, back, back then it was significant. I feel like it's still significant. I think there's a big difference between, you know, the crowd that's more academically oriented and organization, educational, all of that, which is absolutely necessary. But the larger crowds are important to the people who come out because I, I consider that, uh, you know, that's the people's sentiment, how they come. I thought it was good when you'd see crowds come out and they had, had to, they were fed up with COVID and all that lockdown. Wasn't it great to see people getting together and planning a meeting at the PTA or someplace and everybody was un, unhappy, but one person, all you needed was one person to stand up and say, this is crazy, let's get rid of this nonsense. And that was sort of opening the do, door. There's still a lot of that pain and suffering from that, but. But still, uh, it's shifted. So uh, I do always look for some positives, and Daniel and I talk about this a lot on the program. And <laughs> when it's pretty bad, we still may give us our, uh, you know, put out our opinion on it. And uh, Daniel say, oh, this is terrible. I say, yeah, but we got to find something positive. It is so bad. If somebody's going to wake up and say, I can't believe that. I better look into this. So, yeah, the bad news wakes up some people. And, but but uh, we're convinced that it's the ideological that, uh, that re really counts. But I always wanted to assess. It was easy to assess audience for, for political reasons. But sometimes the audiences were mixed and, and they weren't there as supporters or a political event. And I, I would, you know, wonder, are they going to be supporters? So it was always nice. 
to walk around and talk to the students or whoever was in the crowd. And uh, I, I did a little bit of that here because I talked to a few people and I found out that it sounds like this is gonna be a good group. They're probably even for ending the Fed. <laughs> Because uh, the story is, you probably have heard it, but I, I found it fascinating because uh, I, I'm real interested in the ideas and changing people's opinion. But uh, we had a debate, I think it was in Detroit, and uh, I can't remember what year it was, but the, I, it was early on because uh, we went over to Ann Arbor, and I think there's a university over there that's not quite conservative, yeah. <laughs> But when we got over there, there was a large crowd, and uh, I think I was delayed, which was against my, my preferences because I can't stand politicians who think that, oh, it's pretty neat to make this crowd wait for three hours and then I finally get there. But I was a little late and I didn't, I didn't like that. But we came down, it was an outdoor, it was an outdoor rally. And that is where the first time I heard, uh, you, you know, somebody, oh, well, the first thing is I noticed there was a little fires in the, in the audience and they were, they were burning Federal Reserve notes. And, and then somebody started to chant, and the Fed, and the Fed. So I, uh, I thought that, that was pretty neat. So that's why I'm an optimist. Berkeley, they cannot destroy a good man, and they cannot, and even Ann Arbor, you can survive and still, still have a desire for liberty. So I think the worse conditions are, the more people ought to wake up. Sometimes that's true, but some days, it's depressing, there's no doubt about it, you know, and that's why we have to keep going and that's why I say we have to get together because we get energy. We get energy from each other and from people and from meetings and uh, it's an it's a, it's a energy that's uh, philosophic, but it's also an emotional energy that you get. And people's personalities and character make a big difference. So because even if somebody's shy and they don't talk, they emit energy. And I think, I think that's important. And I think that's one of the things, it's sort of an invisible thing that comes how, how people get influenced. So I'm always pleased when uh, I'm surprised that where do the people come from? <laughs> How are things going? But they'll come and say, you know, that they, you know, at the meetings, they would feel better about it because they were with like-minded people. And then, you, then they say, yeah, but it's a small number. You know, you, yeah, you had 8,000 people at Berkeley, but I think there are more than 8,000 people on campus. So you still only have a percentage of it, but it's still very, very important. You know, uh, the, the numbers don't count, and I remember, Leonard Reed so often would say, it, it's not the percentage, it's not the number, it's what you believe in. And uh, what, what he would say is, we, we look for leadership and uh, getting people to speak out. And there's so many in this category. You know, I could go around here and name everybody, but I wanna name all of you because you're here, you support what, what's happening, we know where you believe in, and just a few minutes ago, it was confirmed that you're willing to end the Fed. So that's good. <laughs> but you, you know, now, now to end the lying. The lying is still going on, you know, and it, it's pretty vicious, but uh, that, that to me is a, a big job, you know, to get people to tell the truth. I, uh, I work on the assumption that uh, uh, there is not, there is not much uh, left of the American Republic. And my thesis on this is there was a coup. <laughs> it, it was not the kind of coup that we operate when we run a coup in Ukraine. It's crystal, crystal clear. We go in and throw one out and put a new one in. Oh, the coup's occurred. Now, now, now we've changed all that we have. So uh, I think that uh, the, the coup in America, in my little booklet I did, one uh, first thing is I think the destruction of the Republic, which Tom knows so well, started with Hamilton. <laughs> you know, he was they were they were undermining you, you know the true nature of what we wanted or the founders wanted very early on. But it's amazing, even with all all the arguing and fighting going on. 
and the bad things that we had to go through. You know, it, uh, it, it did pretty well, but the founders warned if, there's, uh, if the moral climate of the people, you know, vanishes, then there's nothing, nothing there. The, um, the, uh, the, the Republic will be destroyed. And of course, I think we're essentially there, but I also have a strong belief in, uh, in religious terms, it's been used for a long time, and that's the remnant. The remnant, you know, if, uh, if there was a, a, a religion or a spiritual truth, uh, even though that may come down hard and conditions would make it so that it was very unpopular and nobody wanted to talk about it, that, uh, that is, you know, very, very important. Uh, but the, uh, the coup uh, actually is, is the, uh, you know, with it happening, you know, and why truth is so important, and people who operate the coup, and that's what we refer to as the deep state and all the other people, they, they cannot stand. Their biggest enemy of the clowns on television, and they're not all in one party, believe me, and, and I think Daniel pointed that out. I mean, that, it can be shared, you know, you shared. They, 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 uh, uh, they, they, they know who, exactly who the enemy of, and for some of them, or most of many of them, the coup is you. You know, that's what has to be stopped, especially when they're semi-retired or retired and they want to hang around to make sure the truth is continue to be told. It's very, very uh, annoying. And that's, uh, that happens all the time. But I think we were, in our nation, we were introduced to pretty sound uh, ideas. I think the Jeffersonians and the predecessors to that you know, gave us some information, but it, it was ancient history. It went all the way back. I think the, uh, I think the coup uh, had to deal with everything from the very beginning. And when I looked into this more, uh, you know, even before there was written law, even though, though when law was more uh, verbal and, uh, and, and Hammurabi was the one that tried to write this down, but, uh, and they were, they were the early people who dealt with right and wrong uh, had a lot of shortcoming. But uh, the, the first society that most people give credit to, to really recording it and dealing with it was uh, Samaria. And there was a code. And I, I looked at that stuff and there were some similarities in there. Did you know that all those, all the way back as you can find, now I may be wrong and maybe there's a historian here who say that's not true, before history data. No, my argument is that from the beginning of time, the beginning of understanding, even, even before books were written, there was an understanding of right and wrong. And uh, I believe it, and I may, it, it might always be an assumption, but I think that, uh, that, is, uh, that, that has been true. But they, uh, the, uh, the uh, people that knew and understand that, of course, that was passed on. And of course, there was, uh, you know, a lot of contribution over thousands of years. You know, uh, Je Jefferson was instrumental, but, but he didn't invent, he didn't invent, uh, you, you, you know, uh, the, the whole concept. He promoted it and it was good. But the, the, uh, this, the whole understanding of what liberty is about has been around a long time and it has it came together. And this is my, my estimation. It came together and blossomed with Western civilization. I think there is something that people can deal with and say, this is part of Western civilization. And so uh, there are some that say, uh, you, know, uh, who, <laughs> you know, who stole Western civilization? It seems so uncivilized and it, it is that way. But once again, I, I think there's a lot of things Technologically, if, you're to, if you include technology advancement as part of Western civilization developing, I mean, that, that is unbelievable what ha has gone on in a couple hundred, couple thousand years. That's a, just a drop in the bucket when, I, when you talk about the opportunity for something happening billions of years, you know, and yet we uh, as human beings have only a record, you know, Thousand, few thousand years, six, six thousand years ago, there was starting to be, there was talk, you know, even about the value of gold and different things like that, six thousand years. That, that to me is such a drop in the bucket. So what we, as we go through life, it's a drop in the bucket 
it doesn't give you a whole lot of opportunity to understand as much as you can and contribute to it. So I think that that is the uh, one thing that we can work on because there's a limited amount of time. But I think, uh, I think Western civilization, uh, you, you know, is, is really fantastic. But it's bipolar in a sense. There's good and bad. And one of the best examples of that would be uh, nuclear, nuclear energy. I mean, when you think of it, if you'd have had perfect liberty and you needed nuclear energy to provide, you know, power, just think of all the different things that could have been developed to minim you know, m minimize it, you know, make it small units. And uh, I, I think there's so much energy that we have been blessed with throughout history and what we have on, on our planet that there would never be a need. It's the introduction of evil that comes along and say, oh no, we need to use this to maintain power, to make sure people behave and do things the way we, the way we want. And they have come in and they have used it. And of course, most technology can be used for good or bad. And uh, so I think that, uh, you, you know, in politics and ideology, it's a, it's a mixture of things because uh, if you don't deal with that and just go along, then you have uh, sort of a system of, uh, of problems that we uh, have to deal with. And the one that we have to deal with today is uh, bankruptcy. Uh, in many ways, bankruptcy today is very complicated because uh, we talk about moral bankruptcy. That's not difficult to find and, and see what happens. And we've been warned about it and we know about it. So you can't, you can't expect uh, a system based totally on uh, voluntarism, which is a good idea. But uh, if, if you have moral corruption, then volunteerism is, is uh, changed and destroyed by the people who uh, have different goals. And, and the one thing that has developed over the years is this whole idea that you people out there, what do you think about? You, you, you think there's truth. We talk about this as if uh, uh, Chris was cautious to say, we don't pretend we know all the truth, but we know what we're seeking. We seek the truth. And they, that is, uh, I think, very important. But, uh, but there's a group of people, unfortunately, I'll ask Daniel what the percentage is, but uh, I think the percentage must be about 80 or 90 percent that uh, think that, uh, uh, you, you know, you don't know what the truth is. Oh, well, they say, because if they knew what truth was and that taking an oath would mean something, have you ever stopped to think how many people in our history, a couple hundred years, took the oath of office and how many times did they violate the oath of office? I mean, it is just astounding, you know, that, uh, that, they, that they, don't, uh, they don't follow through and that people come in. And uh, so th then the people get control because then there's a fight between good and evil. And uh, you have people come in and they get involved in the educational system like a George Soros and others and get involved in a legal system. The competition is out there. Uh, but it's, it's something that we have to contend, to contend with. We have to realize how difficult it is because it, uh, the people who want political power for very, very selfish reasons, I mean, that will drive them. But they say, you people who say you're seeking truth, there is no such thing as truth. It's, so don't look anymore. So there's a vacuum out there, you know, uh, the, the republic is destroyed and you can't know truth. So what, what are we going to do? Well, we have to maintain order. And of course, oh yeah, that'd be a good idea. Order, we like that. No, you know, peace and all that. But uh, you'll still have to somebody, have somebody to draw up some rules and regulations. And they're all too ready to do that. And they love it up. And they believe they're good. They become, you know, there's the rejection of a spiritual nature, but they substitute it with their belief in themselves that they know what is best for everybody else. And I remember during the campaign, uh, I had a little phrase, I said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't wanna run your life. I don't wanna tell you how to spend your money. I don't wanna tell other countries, you know, what to do. I said, because I'm not smart enough and I don't know. But there's only one rule, we'll let you do whatever you want 
suffer the consequences of you mess up, and uh, I think the world would be better off. But, uh, and you know, that was appealing to a lot of young people because and they did ask more questions uh, about taxation. I said, that's not complex. Under a volunteer, a volunteer society, there are no taxes, no income tax. You get rid of the income tax, and you have to have honest money. And all of a sudden, their eyes would open up and say, hey, that doesn't sound so bad. What would you do with the drug war? Well, uh, I'd get rid of the drug war. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd spend my time as a physician and others to show how stupid it is to use these drugs. And, uh, but but that's, it's so appealing to young people. The big thing is, and I would get an applause from it. I said, the one thing is, if you have this freedom, that if you screw up, you know, if you don't take care of yourselves, you don't take care of your health, and you don't get educated, you don't do all this, uh, then, then uh, you can't go to the government. You can't go to your neighbor. You know you're not allowed to steal from your neighbor, and most of them know that. Most people know they can't steal from their neighbor. If they have two cars and their neighbor only has one, none, uh, I'll steal one car. Uh, they, most people know that still, even though they're doing it all the time. Right now, it looks like it's, uh, it's getting epidemic. So they, they know, know that. But there is no recourse in their minds if they want to send the congressman. I'll get the politician. And it energizes these special interest groups to get together because their, their, their sacred goal is to uh, have the dictatorship of the majority. Majority's democracy, it makes me sick. <laughs> you know, the way that it's used. All you have to do is have the majority. Well, I like the idea if there's a spontaneous crowd come out and they all are chanting for in the Fed, you know, what's wrong with that majority? But uh, the, the, the majority that they're talking about is control of government, control of you, assuming that you don't know what's best for yourself, you don't know how to spend your money, you don't know how to take care of children, that's why you can't depend on the family, and on and on, because they substitute, they become, uh, you know, godlike. And uh, there, was, there was one statement, I was reading a little bit on what made George Soros tick, and uh, they had on a quote, he says, Sometimes, I'll sort of add a little bit. He says, sometimes I sort of think I'm a god. <laughs> and and that, that, that sort of explains some of that. And, uh, and the way he traced his history, this open society. The first time I came across this, this doesn't sound so bad. What's wrong with an open society? But, it, but it's not our open society, believe me. The more open it is, the more closed it is, and the more authoritarian it is. But, but, but he, uh, he started off as a hardcore uh, Marxist, uh, communist, and all of that. And he, he, uh, he shifted his gears. The, the first thing, he recognized that communism wasn't working so well. So then he was devising his mind another system which was more like... Uh, a radical corporatism. You got to be practical. You got to get this thing to work. So, uh, but he, it's, it's amazing how thoughtful he was, and the more he thought about these things, the worse, worse he got. You know, because it was always, it was always anti-spiritual, anti good versus evil. You can't know, uh, you can't know the truth, and uh, you end up with a Soros. And uh, he feels he still. I mean. Uh, doesn't he know that eventually he won't be around, <laughs> you know? But uh, he, he's still at it, and uh, it, it's amazing how they can take some words. You know, uh, I, think, I think a good libertarian is sort of for an open society. But the one thing is, we still have a moral imperative. And that is, yes, you, have, you, you don't have to pay taxes, uh, and uh, you can spend your money the way you want. You're not going to get engaged in war. But uh, the, thing, the thing of it is, if you uh, get, get, get into trouble, what, what are you going to do about it? That, that is where the trouble is. So they always uh, open up the door to those people who are born authoritarian. 
And that's what they think they have to do. And they believe it in a, in a moral sense. They believe they're really doing, uh, doing good. I heard uh, one, one uh, uh, individual, one libertarian that I thought was, because some libertarians won't uh, have uh, as much of a spiritual bending uh, as others. And, and somebody will say, well, uh, so-and-so, uh, I think he was referencing uh, Hillary, you know, and her attitude. And when she had something to do with starting wars and promoting wars. And, and this, this libertarian who uh, said, she, and I thought it was a great description and understanding, she has no shame. And they don't. They don't have shame. And, uh, and that's what we have to contend with uh, is... And, and, and that's, that is a big job and, and it's not surmountable. Uh, all, all I say is if you don't like it, you can compete with it by setting a standard. What, what else can you do? Because uh, deep down, I think, uh, I think we're, there's, there's something in many people in their soul when they hear about this that, uh, that, that they will open up. But, uh, you know, this has gone on throughout all of history, the, you know, cycles, you know, people would become less, uh, less violent than other times and there would be more free markets. But generally speaking, there's been progress. Western civilization has continued uh, to develop materialistically and mechanically and invention-wise. Uh, it's, it's unreal what is happening now uh, and it's hard to keep up with, with it. They, uh, that, that to me, I think, is so, so important because I, I thought there was a time when people, excuse me, people would, uh, would consider the issue of war. People should be against war, right? But there's some TV yesterday, you know, one of the, the ones that annoy me a little bit more than the others, they all annoy me, but, <laughs> but what, about, what about the very, very conservative constitutionalist Republican, you know, begging and pleading for more weapons to go to three different parts of the world? He's scared to death that uh, peace is going to break out. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a, job, a job and a half. Uh, I think that um, there's every reason to be involved because, you know, I think, I think of when you go through a lifetime, are you going to feel halfway good about what, what you've done? And I keep thinking about uh, the militant abortionist uh, that every day, that's all they want to talk about and, and uh, why it, it is the most precious right in, a, in, in the world. And as a physician and somebody being in politics, believe me, I think I understand the issue pretty well of the sad things that, that can happen. And that, uh, but, but this whole idea of an individual spending all this energy in one thing and saying, and then they misname, misname it. They call it reproductive rights. Well, how does, it, how does interfering with abortion have anything to do with reproduction? It's destruction. You know, that's the whole thing. But that, once again, goes back, and it's probably going to be spiritual and moral, uh, how people, you know, come up on the decision of, uh, of, of, of personal rights. And uh, it, is a, it, it is an interesting you, you know, subject, uh, but it's a very, very tough one, uh, you know, when it comes to dealing with that. Uh, and the libertarians have been divided on it a lot because you know, they say, well, the mother's rights, it's, it's, it's her body. But I'd say, okay, uh, it's her body, so she's pregnant. Uh, so I can do whatever I want, unless there's some other influence. And uh, they, she, so, that, so they turn around, it's her, her right. But what, what, what if uh, it's her body? But what if the baby's born and it's in the crib? Isn't it your castle? Isn't it your house? Don't you believe in private property? So 
that there is no way you can make, uh, make, the, de uh, make the decision and, uh, and say, oh, it's okay one time because that's not human. And believe me, there's times, those first four, five, six weeks, if you, if you think you can regulate every pregnancy within a couple of weeks, it's, not gonna, it's, it's just not uh, legally or medically possible to happen. So in many cases, you know, the issue is void of, uh, of a, moral, um, a moral notion of what we, what we should do. But uh, it is emotional. But for the people, I, I still can't see these people on TV that lecture and misname everything, and they wouldn't dare think that they're taking a life, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and do that for a whole life. I mean, just as we believe, we spend a lot of our energy trying to, to you know, uh, generate, uh, you know, a free society and personal, personal responsibility. And uh, yet somebody else doing exactly the opposite. See, I can't comprehend how, where the satisfaction will come. And uh, maybe the answer to that is they probably don't have any because the, the worse things get, the more they want, you know, to have, have, have the control. But uh, there's lots of work that we have to do. I think many things that uh, in our society is motivated, motivated by hate and, and greed. Somebody explained to me that greed is okay as long as you uh, just use that as a motivation to do better with what you're doing. So, but uh, uh, hey, hate certainly drives a lot of it, and we see that uh, in, in what's happening. But there are sometimes I hear have some issues that they make it complicated. And every once in a while, I had an accident during those debates. I would limit my defense bias with one sentence. Uh, you know, like, what would you do if you were in charge of bringing these troops home? I mean, getting them out of the Middle East. Well, of course, they shouldn't have sent them. I said, we just marched in. We could just march home and get out of those areas. And uh, <laughs> sometimes that, that's a lot easier. But, uh, you, you know, I, th I think that uh, we have specific things that we can do with. And one is hope that there's a, you know, a slight opening for coming to some common sense for dealing with uh, somebody like Assange. But there's probably thousands of Assange problems out there. You know, people being penalized in prison and all of that. And uh, I, I just think that uh, uh, if, if we recognize where we are, what we're doing and what is important, uh, but I did uh, list in my little booklet that uh, yes, history has been around for a long time, and uh, civilization has been developing. Generally, there's more more uh, benefits than uh, than uh, one would believe. But I, I uh, not the 1960s. I know I've been I probably went too long. <laughs> uh, what what uh, the, 19, the 1960s are very were influential on me. I got out of medical school in the early 60s, 1960, and I went to Henry Ford Hospital in Michigan, and I was in the middle of a residency, and uh, I was drafted. The Cuban, Cuban crisis was going on, and the um, Vietnam War was going on, so, so I was drafted. Now, I want to tell one short story about my introduction to the military. So here I am. I, uh, I had to go and get my physical at Selfridge Air Base. So I go in there and get the debate, and there was a counter up there, and some of the uh, uh, lower-ranking military personnel was there. Okay, okay, here, come up here. here, here. They, they had a, they had the uh, physical examination history, and uh, there were three pages. I said, well, are they all the same? Uh, oh, okay, you have to fill them out. So I, I filled them out. Just I was so totally obedient. I filled them out, three copies of the same thing. They, they probably never heard of a copy machine or a computer. <laughs> so uh, I took them back up to the desk after I was moaning and groaning and filling this thing out. So I pay, this is, this is probably not believable, but then again, you believe anything. So I handed the three thing there and the clerk there took two of them and tore them up and threw them in the wastebasket. <laughs> I said, what are you doing that for? He says, the regulations only says you have to have them fill it out. They didn't tell us what we were supposed to do with it. I thought, boy, now I'm just getting involved in this thing. <laughs> so that, that was a little, little bit crazy. Uh, so I, I think that uh, 
I think there's a lot we can do. The one thing, when people would ask me, especially on the college campuses, because there was sometimes, uh, many of you have already experienced it, sort of a light bulb comes on and things fall in place. They come together, you know, whether it's civil liberties or whatever the issue is, that, uh, you, know, you know, a nonviolent, non-intervention society is not hard to figure out. It, it's, a, it's pretty e easy. So if, uh, if people do that and, and if, if, if it's easy to figure out, uh, I, I would think that uh, people ought to, you know, re realize that it's not that difficult. You know, the rules don't, the, just think, the one thing nice when I talk about the free market, it's all volunteerism. If you and I don't agree, we don't do it. It's canceled. What, what, what if you have an agreement? Draw up a contract before you get together. And, and you have to have a contract, you have to have property, you have a few things like that, but it solves most of the problems. The, the whole principle of volunteerism, who comes into your house? Well, I'll check with the government, this sort of thing. But anyway, I remain an optimist, but I tell you what, it's, uh, it's not always easy, but I tell you what, I always benefit from coming and visiting with a group like this. And I thank you very much for being here.